I wish to explain it to him who asks, I do not know. So I thought that I'll try to understand it empirically, hoping that that would lead me to the spiritual, looking around me and within to observe what time has done. Of course, I just had to look in the mirror this morning to see what time has done. <laughs> Lots of gray hairs that I just kept screaming at, hoping that they would go away. But I've learned that time is that thing that can, it, that can get filled with learning much, loving much, laughing much, and then changing much. And I'd like to recount some of the things that I have learned, hoping that for the graduating class and the rest of you who are sitting here, that you will ask yourself also how your time has been filled up and how you'd like to spend the rest of your time. In terms of learning much, I've learned so much about the value of things. And while you've been at Redeema, you've probably learned to value the community here at Redeema, the, the, the accessibility to your props, the freedom to express your faith. You need to hold fast to those things because they'll not necessarily be a value to someone else. And I'm reminded of a time when, uh, actually this was just last year, when my youngest son Jojo uh, was getting ready for Halloween. And first of all, that was something that um, wasn't very easy for me. Coming from a very superstitious African background, anything to do with ghouls and witches is, is terribly demonic. You don't do Halloween. How can you walk around dressed like something evil? So it's taken me a really long while to get comfortable with Halloween. And then he tells me he wants to be a pirate. I'm thinking, like, okay, gotta get a patch, gotta look like, uh, you know, something from Pirates of the Caribbean. And he goes, no, no, I actually want a sash because I want to be a ninja pirate. <laughs> Don't know what that is. But he seemed to know, so he said, you just need to get a green sash, and not a girly green, Mom. <laughs> I didn't know there were different kinds of green that could be described as girly and boy, you know, boy green. So I started looking around. Every little piece of fabric that I brought home, Jojo said, wasn't the right kind of green. So about two days or so before Halloween, I thought, I'll go to the one place that I know I can find quirky green. That's Valley Village. <laughs> so I went to my local Valley Village, and as soon as I entered, and this was bright flash of lights, and I thought, I'm not that close to menopause. I can't imagine <laughs> what that could possibly be. <laughs> and so I looked towards the back, was this very bright colored cloth that reminded me of Ghana, which is where I was born. So I made just that straight line towards that piece of cloth. And there was before me a cloth that back home we would call Kente cloth. And Kente was designed by uh, a very, very gifted weaver for the chief of the Ashanti tribe. And if you know any uh, African history, the Ashantis were a warrior tribe. And one day the chief said, I'd like someone to weave me the, the, the most beautiful cloth in the world. And this man called Prempe came back with different colored cloths. And if you, you notice, African cloth is usually very, very brightly colored. And this was one of them. So I looked at it, I touched it, and I knew it was the original thing. It feels like a rug. It's very, very heavy. So, as you always do, you turn around to look at the price. Well, this was Valley Village. I wasn't expecting it to be that much. It was $4.99. I thought, whoa, I'd totally forgotten about Jojo's green sash. And there I was picking this, what to me was precious cloth. I took it to the front, and as, as I was walking towards the front, I was looking around me thinking some bells were going to go off, police were going to come and arrest me. This is crazy. How come this be 4 99 And then I realized nobody else here knew that this was worth more than $4.99. So I took it home, all the while thinking I'd stolen something. I felt like I'd stolen something. <laughs> I got home and my mom had just uh, come from Ghana to come and visit. So I ran straight to her and I said, Mom, take a look at this. And she saw it, she just had to look at it and she said, where did you get that from? And I said, Valley Village. She said, don't let me beat you up. <laughs> go, Valley Village, you don't have to beat me for this. And she said, but that's impossible. I said, I know. You don't find this kind of stuff at Valley Village. But then again, you probably do because Valley Village is <laughs> so she opened, it was about four yards of this cloth, and she had tears in her eyes, and I asked her, why? And she said, this is called Adrinasa, and Adrinasa translated means, there is no more skill. This is one of the oldest pieces of cloth from
from Ghana. And it's so precious because the chief who was given this kind of cloth said there's no more skill in the world. Nobody can make anything as beautiful as this anymore. So it was called Adjinasa, there is no more skill. Nothing you can make can be as beautiful. So mom said, do you know what you're holding? This could go for at least $600. I said, all right, I got it for $4.99. <laughs> Take it back and go and tell them. Are you kidding me? $600. But it meant absolutely nothing to the person who took it there, to the people who removed it from that black garbage bag, to those who looked at it and thought, oh, this looks like a rug. Let's put it in the fabric section. Until I came along, I couldn't have been the first person who saw that. But everybody who walked by just thought, oh, brightly colored cloth, fancy, exotic, until I came along. So much of what we value may not be valued by others, but it doesn't mean that that thing is not of value. I've learned also about moving on. Some of you may have changed your majors once, twice, possibly three times. Mm -hmm. But I've learned that there are times when we must move on. My sister is always joking with me because I'm with a certain phone company whose name I cannot mention. But they constantly drop my calls. And the last time that this happened, she said, why don't you just move on? And I said, it's 45 bucks. Why should I move on? Besides, it drops just your calls. <laughs> But I've learned that when something is not working, you need to step back and ask God, God, what are you trying to tell me? Is there something else that I must be doing? I'm sure that for many of our graduating class, this has probably happened too. Hopefully, you've learned that there's a big world out there waiting for you to explore it, and that the world may not be exactly what you're used to. While supervising students, I've come across so many stories that have surprised me uh, just because it doesn't seem like our world. Like the story of uh, one of our students who was teaching in an inner city, in inner city Hamilton, who said she noticed that there were uh, two siblings in the school and, and whenever one was there, from about November onwards, whenever one was there, the other one wasn't there. And so one time she asked uh, the girl, it was a girl and a boy, and the girl said, well, we have just one jacket between us. And so when it gets cold, we have to decide who wears the jacket to school. And I remember thinking of all the jackets that are lying on the floor in my house. And my kids are like, I don't like this one. I wore this yesterday. This was last year's jacket. And it has hit me that the world is so much bigger than what I have, uh, what I have come to, to think, think it is. There's a girl this year, as well, in one of our student teachers' uh, classrooms, who talks about herself in the third person. Mary wants to go to the washroom. Mary doesn't like this. She's never there. She's never really there. And a realization that the work that we do on a daily basis, the people that we meet on a daily basis, God is calling us to reach out to them in so many ways. I've learned also that we have to laugh a whole lot more and laughing about the things that may initially irritate, but later on they're a bit quirky. Like the time I was going to visit a student far away, I can't even remember the town, but I'm one of those Greater Toronto people who never ventures out where there are cows and goats and sheep. <laughs> and so I had to go and supervise a student who was uh, outside of my boundaries. And I got onto the highway, and the GPS was telling me, get off the highway, get off the highway. So I started, I thought, okay, I must, because I'm not quite sure where I'm going. And it just kept on taking me uh, along the back road. I thought, this is odd, I'm seeing cows. I don't want to see cows. <laughs> this is wrong. <laughs> and I'm getting late. And they're going to say, this is African timing. No, I must be on time. But needless to say, I got there late. I apologized, everything was fine. I got back into my car. I thought, this is ridiculous. Why was it telling me to get off the road? So I checked the GPS, and true enough, the setting was changed from auto to pedestrian. <laughs> now, who would do this in my family? Hmm. Kwam, my middle child, who experiments with every single thing. I came for him in his teenage years. <laughs> so I got home, and he was bright and chirping. I said, Kwam, 
Mom, did you play with the GPS? Uh, yeah, maybe. No big deal to him. I said, did you change anything? Oh, yeah. What did you take? change? I changed it to pedestrian. Why? Oh, I just wanted to see what would happen. <laughs> I said, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. But I've learned to laugh at such things, even if I am initially embarrassed. So it's also been very funny for me to get into classrooms here, uh, whenever I'm supervising students. And whenever there's one black kid in the class, all the other kids turn around and say, is that your mom? <laughs> Stop. 